My name is Paul White. I'm an attorney here in Nashville, and this is an interview of Ralph DeMarco. Louis Raphael DeMarco is his mm -hmm. full legal name. We are doing this in the offices of the Nashville Bar Association, and it is Thursday, February the 29th, 2024. The interview is being conducted for the Legal History Project of the Nashville Bar Association. So, Ralph, would you repeat again your full legal name? Uh, Louis Raphael DeMarco. And would you tell us your date and place of birth? I was born September 7th, 1948 in the old St. Thomas Hospital on Hay Street here in Nashville. And let's talk a few minutes about your birth family, because uh, I know from long association with you that one of your hobbies, and we'll go into this later also, but one of your hobbies is genealogy. And I know that your family is fairly prominent in Tennessee history. So tell us a little bit about your grandparents. Well, my grandfather was Charles Henry Rutherford Sr. He was an attorney here for over 50 years. He started practice with his brother, Alf Rutherford, uh, in the 1890s here in Nashville. And Alf Rutherford eventually became a judge of the Third Circuit Court and then the First Circuit Court uh, until about 1932. Um, I've got, uh, the, the, my, uh, grandmother, uh, was Charles, was, uh, Ella Clyde Wheeler, and she was from Kentucky. They, they, these are my maternal grandparents. My, uh, grandparents on my father's side was Prosper, Prospero DeMarco, and, um, he was from Natchez, Mississippi, and that's where I grew up, but we'll get into that later. The, the uh, and Camille Doretta was my maternal grandmother. Uh, but as far as the uh, history of the family here, the um, they were here. Uh, James Wood Rutherford came in the 1780s and married Elizabeth Cartwright. She came over on the flatboats. On the original settlers of uh, Elizabeth Cartwright was one of the original settlers of Nashville. She was only four years old. Robert Cartwright was her father. Uh, they came over and settled in uh, Goodlesville area. They came over in April of 1780, original settlers there. She lost several brothers to being scouted by Indians, actually. And she may have been the only daughter he had. He, uh, Robert Cartwright had a number of sons, and they settled in the Goodlesville area, and some are still, still there. Uh, my wife's family, incidentally, the, her mother's side, came over on the same uh, flatboats uh, and settled uh, the Gowers and Robertsons. James Robertson's mother was a Gower, and she's related to that side. So they are, both of our families go back several hundred years. And when you're talking about the flatboats, I believe that's a reference to the Donaldson party. The Donaldson party that came over. Robertson yeah. brought the men overland, and the women and children came with Donaldson down the rivers on the flatboats. And they met yeah, in April of 1780. I think the um, Robertson party, the men, uh, got here in um, right around Christmas Day, I believe, of 1779. So, Well... Now, I had a note here uh, that I thought was very interesting about your grandfather, never uh, C.H. Rutherford Sr., never went to law school. Uh, tell us a little bit about how that worked. Well, back in the day, you didn't have to go to law school to practice. You had to study under a lawyer and get approved by, I guess, a committee or a judge, maybe just a judge, and ask you a few questions and and uh, determined that uh, you were able to practice. And so he he uh, was able to do that. I don't know who he went before to to uh, get approved. His brother, Alf Rutherford, was a graduate of the Vanderbilt Law School, uh, probably sometime in the uh, 1880s, I suppose. So uh, it's when he started. So one thing I meant to mention, uh, James Wood Rutherford, he came in the 1780s, married Elizabeth Cartwright. She was probably 15. But they married in uh, 1791 in book one, page one of the Davidson County marriage records. So I've seen those records. So quite interesting. Okay. 
<clears throat> and then there's, I had a note here, I, I believe it refers to C.H. Rutherford, that he had eight children. Eight children. Okay. Uh, my mother was six out of the eight. So, and of those, um, I guess four were attorneys. So, uh, Charles Rutherford Jr., James or Jimmy Rutherford, uh, David Rutherford, and Alf Rutherford. Alf Rutherford was actually the circuit court clerk here, too from 1950 to 1968 when he passed away. So you have a long history of members of your family practicing law in Davidson County. Right. There's, I believe, four or five first cousins. Uh, uh, Bill Rutherford was a first cousin. Uh, Jimmy's son was a judge here in the um, 1970s. So, and I think I remember he died in office. Is that he did? He was unexpectedly forty three had a sudden heart attack when he was tall and thin. So I remember him. He was a very handsome and dignified jurist. Right, he was. I, I actually practiced a few cases for him. So interesting. Um, so tell us a little bit about your childhood. Well, I was when I was born. Um, <clears throat> My grandfather, Charles Rutherford, had given my uh, parents as a wedding gift a lot over in Inglewood uh, from the Gavin and Stratford, I believe. And uh, my father built a house there, helped build it. Uh, and when I was born, that was a house we lived in until I was three years old. And then my, my uh, father's father, was a pharmacist in Natchez, Mississippi, and had some health issues. So dad wanted to help him out. So we moved down there and dad uh, got his pharmacy degree from Ole Miss. And um, he, he had been to Peabody. Both of my parents graduated from Peabody here in Nashville. And uh, so anyway, he got his pharmacy degree and became a pharmacist and helped my grandfather out. So we lived in Natchez from 1951, and I went through all the school, the school system down there from kindergarten through high school. And um, uh, that was interesting. I had some of the same teachers my father had there. And um, that, that, was, that was an experience growing up in, in Natchez, which didn't really appreciate it at the time. But going back, Natchez is an old historic town. It's actually the oldest town on the Mississippi River, older than Memphis, older than New Orleans, older than St. Louis. Um, and I think 1716 maybe is when it was founded. And the uh, so it's historic. There were a lot of antebellum homes. There were more millionaires per capita living in Natchez before the Civil War than anywhere else in the country. They built these all these mansions there uh, and they had cotton plantations around there in Mississippi and over in Louisiana. So, and, and Natchez is right on the Mississippi River. It's um, borders Louisiana, almost three sides by Louisiana. We would go to Louisiana, uh, oftentimes growing up to fish and lakes over there and bar pits. Uh, I caught my first fish in a bar pit over there in Louisiana. And bar pits, when that term came about, they would build levees to keep the the river out and they dig holes uh, and they borrow the dirt to build the levees and it became bar for short for borrow bar pits and it fill up with water eventually and fish would go in there and they didn't fish so <laughs> that was one little interesting thing so I remember going over there and, and doing that a lot and of course growing up our uh, TV stations. So I think we had one in Jackson, Mississippi. That was a Mississippi station. Then we had about three in Louisiana, four maybe actually, the Monroe and uh, Alexandria and Baton Rouge. And occasionally on a weird day, we had antennas back then, antenna TVs, didn't have cable. Uh, um, and uh, we'd get a station in Lafayette, Louisiana, which all in French. So you'd be watching TV, it was all in French. So that was one interesting <laughs> thing down there. My father, I have two first cousins, only two first cousins on my father's side, and they both live in Louisiana and Baton Rouge in old days. So um, no DeMarco's there. Uh, mother was my father's sister. So uh, it's interesting 
uh, there. And I've got a ton of cousins on my mother's side, probably 25 first cousins, I think. So on her side, big family uh, on her side here. Just out of curiosity, is anybody else in that large family as interested in genealogy as you are? There are a few cousins that are. I have a few few that are and uh, do that on uh, on my mother's side, but not very many. I've got a genealogy program. A, a lot. David Rutherford was a genealogist on that side of the family, and he did a whole lot of work uh, gathering information. And I copied his a lot of his records and a genealogy program, family tree maker. I've got over twenty nine hundred names on there. So a lot of DeMarco's, and I've been to Italy. Uh, my great-grandfather, Raphael DeMarco, came over in 1870 and settled. At first, he was in, uh, he and his two brothers, at first they were in New Orleans uh, as uh, musicians in the French Quarter. Uh, they earned their passage over by playing the harp. The harp is, in Vigiano, Italy, is a big thing. Uh, they have uh, harp makers and all of that that's been popular. Um, it still is actually in, in Vigiano. And he came over in uh, 1870, stayed in New Orleans for a few years, and then moved to Natchez and uh, married a, uh, married in 17 or 1880, I guess it was, to a uh, young girl that was in the orphanage. Her parents had. Uh, uh, her father had been killed during the uh, right after the Civil War. He died. He'd been he'd been captured. He was in prison camp for a while. Never got his health back. Died a few years after the Civil War. He had to walk home from prison camp, probably up in East Tennessee to Natchez, and um, he died. And my great great grandmother. Uh, last name of Miles, Molly Miles, I uh, just wasn't able to take care of her three children and put them in an orphanage in uh, 1871 after her husband died. So my great-grandfather, when he came over, uh, uh, was looking for a wife, and my great-grandmother was 15, I believe, and he got her out of the orphanage and married her. And um, his brother, younger brother, Prosper DeMarco, and, and my great grandfather at the time was 36, so there's a big difference in age. And his younger brother, who was about seven years younger, married my great grandmother's mother, who was my great great grandmother. So he had a mother and a and a daughter, and they married two brothers. So they were sisters. They were uh, my great great grandmother was uh, her mother, and also her uh, sister-in-law. And so they all had a bunch of kids. And so the all kids looked alike. My, <laughs> my uh, great-grandparents had six children and three. Uh, and my, uh, my grandfather was the youngest of the six. And so uh, the other, uh, my his brother and my great-great-grandmother had uh, three or four children, I believe. So they all looked alike. So it was hard to, in the pictures we got, you can't tell them apart. So. Uh, that was an, the tree didn't branch very far in that in that family, but uh, yeah. And I've I've been interested in genealogy, like you said. I've been all over. You and I have been to Virginia a few times right. to, to uh, Cambria, Virginia, and we researched the courthouses there. I believe he found James Madison's will there in one of the courthouses, just in searching through wills, and. Um, uh, I've been to Vigiano four times, actually, seven, uh, 1978 was the first time, and then 1987, and then 2014, and then last time in 2022 with my two brothers and our wives, we all went there. It's their first time to, to go over there. And so Vigiano is an interesting town. It's a little village. Uh, there are only about several thousand people, and it's a hilltop town. Southern Italy in the middle of nowhere, and Silicata province, which are the 24 provinces in Italy, that was the poorest and most remote. It's down about 100 miles south of Naples, right before you start down the toe of the boot. Tourists don't go there. You're lucky if you can find one person who speaks English. And so, and, and most of the time I have, which is good. But in 1978, it was like going back in time to a medieval town. 
the um, it, it, only one street was paved. Some just had bricks, and they had to climb up a hill on bricks, walking on bricks, and then the cars, just a few cars there. It was very antiquated, uh, very uh, poor, very remote, um, and all of that. And then in, in 1991, I believe it was, they discovered oil there down on the base of the hill. And it turned out it was the largest, still is, the largest oil deposit on the land mass of Europe, right there in that little village. And uh, the off sea, uh, North Sea oil is, is the largest. And I think Scotland and maybe Norway or Denmark use. But uh, that transformed the town. It's still, it, they, it's still the old buildings, but they fixed them up more and the facades are better and the church got fixed up. Uh, the whole province, uh, Silicata, uh, Potenza, got fixed up. The church got uh, renovated. Uh, uh, all the Catholic areas there got renovated. They use it for both uh, uh, Catholic and uh, uh, the civilians there. So, um, and there's a big oil refinery down at the base of the hill, just huge at night. It's just all lit up. So uh, it has really changed. I'm glad I went when I did. Uh, the um, interestingly, there are several families from Nashville that are also from that little village. The Morello family, the most prominent one, and then there's um, in Clamakia and uh, several others from from that little village. Of several thousand people live uh, have moved to Nashville, and we didn't realize that until the 1970s. Didn't know the connection. But um, and um, they were able to help me when I went over in 1978. It gave me a letter of introduction. I met a, a cousin of theirs, Vincent Truda, who had lived in Nashville back during the war, and he spoke some English. So we were able to communicate. I had the letters of introduction, which was like a, a passport or something. It gave me access to the family and the uh, there are no DeMarco. Well, there are a few DeMarcos I couldn't connect, but uh, in the courthouse, they just opened up the records to me. I was able to go through them all, get the information I needed. Uh, the one copier they had in the whole town was broken, so we loaded up the books, about seven or eight of these heavy uh, gen uh, books of marriages and deaths and all that, and Vincent Trude went with me, and we went down the hill to the little town down a few miles away, um, Villa Diagre, and uh, had a government office there that had a copier. So we were able to copy the records. I uh, came back up and dropped them off. But in the church, they allowed me to, uh, the priest there allowed me to go in the records and spend the day in, the, uh, in those records. Uh, they go back to 1635 with marriages and uh, they didn't have divorces. You didn't get divorced in Italy until maybe the 1950s, I think, but you couldn't. But uh, they had marriage records and death records, and I was able to go through back to the 1790s, and there was a, a record book missing. So I, I probably got back to maybe 1740 on that. And the church records were in Latin. I was able to translate those. The courthouse records actually only went back to 1810. Um, and they're in Italian, so I had to get those and translate those. And I found out this last trip why the probably didn't go back to eight, past 1810. There was a Napoleonic times, and Napoleon invaded them. <clears throat> the people in Vigiano tried to resist, and they lost, and they got um, uh, defeated. And the Napoleon troops came through, and they executed one man for every um, 50 or so male inhabitants or inhabitants of the town they executed. They probably destroyed the records too. So uh, anyway, that was, uh, the records don't go back past that. When I've been back in 1987, the other times there, uh, stricter, everything changes each time. The courthouse personnel all change. Uh, the communists were in charge in 1987. They were strict. They would 
charge me every time I wanted to make a copy and they would go get the records. And that's been the case since then. I didn't get access to the church records again. So it was good. I went in 1978 and, and got able to get those then because I wouldn't be able to go through those now. Well, with all of this interest in genealogy, and of course, you and I have been friends for 30 some odd years, and I've always been uh, amazed with the records that you and that uh, David were able to accumulate and mm -hmm. the length of time they go back and that sort of thing. But what uh, patriotic or historical organizations uh, do you belong to? Uh, I am a member of the Sons of the American Revolution. I had uh, my great, uh, great, great grandfather, James Wood Rutherford, fought in the revolution and got a land grant here. Also, uh, my mother's mother's side, James Wheeler, uh, fought in, in the Revolutionary War. He was from Kentucky. And uh, I was able to get in through his records. The um, uh, so Sons of the American Revolution, um, uh, a member of um, some of my father's uh, sites. He was a, he fought in World War II. He was a navigator on a B-17, got shot down over Munich. Spent almost a year in a Nazi prison camp. So he was a member of the 380th uh, group or the 8th Air Force. And I remember uh, he was stationed briefly in England. The um, in Parham, and I've been over there twice to the base where he was. They, it's a museum now. I've been over there, uh, so that that group. I'm trying to think. There's some more um, uh, genealogy groups. Uh, Ancestry.com I belong to, but getting back to that, uh, my father uh, when he was in World War II, the uh, I've traced his steps and and uh, uh, from, actually I've been over to the base in Newfoundland. He was stationed in Newfoundland before the war started. He joined, he enlisted on uh, December 7th, 1940. It's Saturday, went to Jackson, Mississippi from Natchez where he grew up and enlisted. And then that was one year to the day before Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor was bombed. So he went, he got his, he was a second lieutenant. He was stationed in Newfoundland when the war broke out. He'd been there actually 14 months. and. Uh, last year, my wife and I went up and saw the airfield there that uh, is now the the airport for uh, Gander, Newfoundland, where it was. And interestingly, the 9-11, that's where the, a lot of the planes came, had to land, they were trying to land in, in, in the United States after they closed the uh, air, airfield here at 9-11 at Gander, at Gander. So we went and saw the town of Gander, which really wasn't there during uh World War II, uh, but sprang, sprang up afterwards. But anyway, been there, and then in 19, let's see, no, 2016, I believe it was, or 2019, my brother and his wife and my wife and I went over and saw the museum and then went over to uh, Munich, and we I was able to, one of his dad's uh, crew members was still alive and we were able to plot pretty course pretty well the site they were trying to bomb and then where he was shot down because we knew the angle and dad jumped had to bail out uh it was his 13th mission on uh on july the 13th uh, uh and uh he was he was shot down all the crew members got out okay and he bailed out so we were able to find pretty close to where he was bailed uh, where he landed when he jumped out and he was captured pretty quickly, uh, which was a good thing because if the civilians had gotten him, they, he would have been hung. Uh, he saw uh, uh, airmen that had been hung, you know, as have Germans were parading him through the town and he saw where uh, other airmen had been hung and he got interrogated and then uh, sent to a prison camp in Barth, Germany, up on the North Sea. Uh, Baltic Sea, rather, and so we went up there and saw that little museum up there, a uh, prison camp, at, at about eight thousand. It was a camp for officers, which were good. Was good because they were a little better treated, perhaps, than some of the other uh, prisoners. So uh, got to see that. So I followed his footsteps in the 
in the military in World War II. And that was that was interesting. I seem to remember David Rutherford telling me a, a somewhat humorous story. And I, I was thinking it was your dad. I may be wrong on this, but about coming down kind of in the town and his parachute landed on top of him. Is that that was that was one of the crew members. The other, every oh. crew member had a story to tell. And uh, Dad landed in the field. And first of all, he got uh, he saw some workers in the field. And they were French peasants, and so he went up to him. He had his little book, and he was trying to talk to him. And he said, "Where are the Germans?" And they kind of went all around. But most of them they laughed at that. But some one of them went and got uh, told on him, and they came and, and captured him. They had a uh, the truck had was coal or coal steam. Uh, the military had a it didn't have a gasoline. It was some kind of steam operated truck, and they used. And they had said when they were going through the town that they had been bombed by then. They got hit right as they were uh, approaching Munich. They had the bomb bay doors open, ready to get hit, ready to drop their bombs. And a flat came up and exploded in the bomb bay doors and set the bombs on fire. So they had to get out pretty quickly. And um, one of the and dad dad didn't pull his parachute quick enough because he, everything was happening, bombs dropping and flat coming up. So he waited and, and almost waited too late. He said it was like jumping off a two story building when he hit. And he said uh, one of the uh, two of the crewmen actually landed. At a German air base, which was, they got, they were Germans were waiting for them, uh, and and uh, one of them landed on the wing of a plane. Uh, John, uh, Marcelo Ray Marcelo from Louisiana landed on the wing of a plane. So he jumped from a plane and landed on a plane. The odds of that were pretty remote. But another fella landed at the base, and the Germans were coming up, and the parachute landed on top of him, and he would go up and raise it up and you know and see a German with a gun pointed at him and close it down and go over and do another one. They, they were all laughing at that. So there was humor in that. And another one, uh, another uh, crew member uh, opened his pair to shoot too soon and but then the bombs were coming and the flames were coming up and the heat. And so he was rising up and going down and rising up and going down. It took him about 45 minutes to get down, he said. He became a preacher after that. So uh, but anyway, those are some of the stories that they, they told. But they all got out okay. And he had one crew member that John Red Eagle from Oklahoma was a full blooded Indian. And he was uh, on, the, on the plane there. So that was interesting that they had that. And, and he, they'd have reunions afterwards. I met John Red Eagle and Ray Marcello and some of the others that had survived. They had reunions back in the 1970s, just the crew members. So that was. That was interesting hearing their war stories from the and what they did. And they've been on shuttle missions from England. They'd fly over, drop bombs in Poland, land in Russia. I think it was actually Ukraine now, looking at, at the map, but they called it Russia. And the and that uh, Russians would, uh, Ukrainians would treat them pretty well, take them out, and give them black bread, and, and all of that. There's some interesting stories. Uh, uh, the pilot trying to gather them up after to go back and they were all spread out through the town because they were in a, uh, originally in a barn that was about to collapse. So it was where the Russians put them. So anyway, they loaded back up and bombed again on the way back to landed in Italy and then went on into England and uh, you know dropped bombs on the way. So that was how they did it. So it was interesting hearing them talk about their experiences. And uh, one of the ones, my brother recorded that, and it was uh, the conversations they had was well, one of them kept saying, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. I don't remember that. So finally asked him, Were you with us or not? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that was that was uh, hilarious. I've got that tape somewhere. If I got a recorder now to play it, so uh, audio tape. But anyway, he came back and he had met my mother at a USO dance, and probably March. Of, I got all my father's uh, records. They were about an inch and a half thick, uh, and he, every time he had a shot, there was a page on that. 
but uh, all of his training and all that. But he was here last week in February and first two weeks in March of 1943 at the relocation center out at uh, near Sidco Drive out that way. They had, had uh, relocation or they call it so reclassification center is what they call hmm. it. And he had been a radio operator and was training to be a navigator. And so he was there in the barracks and they had a USO dance at the YMCA downtown, which is now the Sheridan, maybe something else now. But uh, had a USO dance at the Y and dad didn't dance, but somebody talked him into going. So he went and, and my mother was a teacher here and they were trying to recruit girls to go dance with soldier boys. So they recruited her and she went down. She liked to dance. And so they met there at that USO dance, and which was interesting, just a random meeting. And, yeah. and they were married 44 years until she died. And they were best friends as well as a perfect marriage. Never heard an argument. But anyway, they met there. And interesting when I, interestingly, when I met my wife, uh, she was telling me how her parents met at the same USO dance of all things. Wow. And we figured it was the same time, same dance. The uh he was a he was from western New York and was uh, at station at Camp Forest down in Tullahoma, somewhere in that area, and they bust him up to dance. And her mother was uh, worked for the telephone company and uh she was recruited to go dance. So we don't know if our parents possibly met at that dance or my father danced with her mother or her father danced with my mother. We don't know. So we'll never know. By the time my wife and I met, they were all deceased. So we weren't able to follow up on that. But that was a chance, another chance meeting. Now, you said that was the location was the Sheraton. Is that the one down across from Union Station on uh Broadway? No, or... it's the one uh the YMCA where we went to law school. Uh, and they tore it down, and right. it was the revolving restaurant on top. And I think that's still oh, there. Oh, and it was originally the high up at Seventh. Hyatt, and, yeah, up at Seventh and Union. Seventh and Union, yeah. Okay, next to the Hermitage. Well, I think that's an interesting thing to put in the record historically. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk for a minute about going back to your high school experience and whatever jobs you may have held. Um, before you got to college, what did you do for uh, probably part-time employment back then? Well, I worked in the drugstore. Uh, my dad's drugstore. But then my grandfather had passed away. And so I helped. I, in Natchez, I didn't really help with doing prescriptions. I delivered drugs to uh, and cleaned up the store. And so we had a front area with cosmetics and all of that. And uh, I, I would... Uh, do that and operate the cash register, sell cigarettes, which I didn't have a problem with that. Then one thing I remember, small town, Natchez uh, had about 19, 20,000 people. The, um, you sell cigarettes, and I've forgotten how much, maybe 30 cents a pack. And some people would come in and we, I'm single. Uh, we figured up what it was, you know, a nickel or a dime, uh, nickel for three or four cigarettes you break up in a pack sell them individually <laughs> <laughs> i remember that uh doing that I, I was of course in high school and it was during the uh I was there in the 50s which um then segregation was pop was not popular it wasn't popular with a lot of people but it was um it was the norm for mississippi and i remember getting on a bus down there they had a bus that would run and, nickel uh, with charge uh and i remember getting on and uh, a bunch of uh african americans had to sit in the back and i remember that was kind of a, that was a sad experience and i one thing i like to sit in the back i still get on a bus i go to the back i couldn't sit in the back but anyway uh i remember that segregation and the clan was uh, uh a uh, big part of Natchez at the time, and there'd be fights between the Klan and the, or the boycotts uh, of the town by the NAACP, and the and the Klan would go and counter picket and all of that. So it was it was a rough time. You go home and watch the news, and it'd be something on Natchez uh, the fights. This was 1964, 65, I guess. There were bombings around. There was a uh, uh, core headquarters got bombed on 
that was on the news. That was the corner of East Franklin Street and DeMarco Alley. That was the only DeMarco name there it was, they didn't name, didn't name a street or boulevard after the family. That was DeMarco Alley. And it was where the Corps headquarters was that got bombed. That since then they cleaned that up. It was just a bunch of awful shacks. And now they have the, uh, the public housing projects there and they named it DeMarco Square. So we've got the uh, public housing, but I, I remember going in one of those shacks at one time. We had a, uh, a maid that worked for us, and my mother and someone else had gone in and bought her a phone. And so we could contact her. She didn't have a phone. And we went in, and the, the big living room had a hole in it on the floor, and there were chickens roosting down underneath. There was just, just a lot of poverty down there in, in Natchez at the time. And, all over the South, and I, I think they've really improved improved that a lot since then. But those are some of my memories. I don't think I had any real other jobs. I'd worked during the summer and after school some down there. Uh, then, and then when I came up here, I worked in the drugstore here, helped fill prescriptions. Could fill them on my own, could read the prescriptions and do that, and then I'd deliver the drugs. I uh, had a delivery service, a little Volkswagen uh, drive around the store was it had been Schwartz's and then it was I can't think of the other name after that and then dad bought it we moved up here in 1967 and um, came to Marco's Hackman Park Pharmacy it was later um, all the names uh, Bishop's Pub was there and uh and so Ten the, Angel. Ten I Angel was about to say, is that yeah. where the Ten Angel, Ten Angel was? was? Yeah, they, they closed now. I don't think anything's there anymore. Well, let's talk about your college experience. How did you choose where to go to college? I applied to Ole Miss, uh, Southern Mississippi, and Mississippi State. And got accepted at all three. And, <laughs> and decided, back then, I think if you were a resident of Mississippi, they had to take you. So... Anyway, I didn't worry about getting in school, and I offered my senior year. I planned to go to Southern Miss, and then kind of changed at the last minute. I had a bunch of friends going to Mississippi State, and I didn't know what I wanted to do or major in, so I went on to Mississippi State in Starkville, Mississippi, and stayed in the dorm, and that was a good experience. I was there two, two years and enjoyed that experience of, of being in, in the dorm and, and going to class and I majored in, started out actually majoring in accounting uh, and decided quickly that wasn't for me. And then uh, business administration and history, I, I followed up into those. And then summer of 67, between my freshman and sophomore years, we moved. Dad had an opportunity to buy that drugstore here in, in Natchez, uh, in Nashville, and bought it. And so we moved up and I was having a commute from Starkville to Nashville now. And so I was down there until school was out my sophomore year and then came up here and uh, looked at Peabody and ended up uh, uh, registering at Belmont, Belmont College at the time, which was a small school, about a thousand students total, if that many. And, um, and, and spent two years there, majored in business, minor, a double major in history and economics. I like one course of having a double major in history. So um, history was my favorite subject there in college. And I worked again, like I said, at the, the drugstore. Do you have any memories of any influential teachers from your college years or particular courses that appeal to you? I remember in high school, I'd take honors history classes, Miss Klotz, there was my history teacher, and I really liked her. Her husband was a pharmacist just around the corner in Natchez at a drugstore, competing drugstore. But I remember that history course there, and then uh, I, I can't think of the professor's name now that I, I like a lot, history professor at Belmont, but um, I don't know of any that had, he would have had a particular, and asked me, I could have told you his name, but I he was he was influential as far as as far as uh, professors go. I think but that's all I can remember. Well, then let's talk a little bit about your uh, military service. 
Well, I was kind of limited. The uh, at Missouri State back then, it was land grant college, and you had to attend ROTC. I spent had two years of Army Army ROTC, which was um, fairly time consuming back then. You, of course, had a uniform, you had a weapon, and um, you had the parade field. You'd have to go out to, and I was always getting my thumb caught in the uh, chamber there. Uh, doing the present arms uh, and it was hot in the summertime. You had that big uniform, uh, thick uniform. I enjoyed the courses though that they would give you. There was uh, military history, some and some others. I, I like those. Um, I got to, into law school and got deferred for a, a year <clears throat> from military service in 1970. Born in the draft on that, and then I ended up uh, had allergies really bad, still do, and allergic to food and uh, uh, mold and dust and all of that. So I, I was on taking shots, and so I got deferred uh, medically for that, which is probably a good thing. And I went on and finished law school uh, after that. So I think I remember <clears throat> there was a rather interesting story on how you got into law school. Well, it was kind of sudden because uh, allergies were a problem, but I hadn't gotten any uh, my medical uh, degree, medical information in order at the time. And Dave said, I called up the dean and said, what about law school? And so I got in law school that night. And it was uh, from noon to uh, six o'clock. It was the only time I had. I don't... Uh, to, to get into law school to keep from getting drafted before I could get my uh, uh, medical deferment. Uh, so the uh, Dave called up Dean Lackey and, uh, and I remember dad I went and told him, uh, he said, well, you're in the army now? I said, no, I'm in law school. <laughs> <laughs> what? And so I started law school and met um, uh, memories fading on, on the the fellow I met that uh, signed me up, I, I don't even remember filling out an application. I just, he just gave me my books. Um, uh, Pete. Uh, uh, Pete Cantrell. Pete Cantrell. Yeah, that's who I met. And I paid my, I guess I paid the, whatever it was to sign up at the time, uh, $30 or so. And I uh, don't think I filled out an application, just got my books and went in there and I had on a suit and tie. I didn't know how you dressed and Sat down there in the back of the room, and it was mid-October. I mean, it had been going on six weeks. And Dean Lackey had told my uncle, David Rutherford, so I don't know if he can, how he can do now. We've been going on for a while. So I had to play catch-up. I remember them the professors giving us sites, so-and-so, Southwest, so-and-so. I thought, Southwest? We're not in the Southwest. What was? What does that mean? You know, I figured out eventually it was a site to, and a book to a case. Um, so I, I had to catch up, which I did, fortunately, and I liked law school enough to stick with it, even after I got my medical deferment and made some good friends there in law school classmates. And we still have reunions annually. Our, our class 1974 does. So, um, but that was a nice experience. And I worked in law school. I don't know when you want to get into that. So. Well, I think you had some interesting jobs. Uh, maybe, if I recall from my notes, the while you were in law school, the yeah. police department, uh, yeah, booking room, yeah, the uh, I had uh, well, the first seven or eight months of law school or six months or so, I didn't work. I was playing catch up, right? And uh, the then I got I was, had a job uh, opening at Southwest Publishing, taking in. Uh, but then they would go around selling books and Bibles and college students would in the summer and then come in and report. And I was going to be in the office doing some administrative work, but then also a job opened up in the police department in the booking room. And that was a little more interesting, I thought. So I, I took that position in um, 1970, I guess it was August, September of 1919. 71, I guess it was. And that was a real experience, especially coming from a sheltered life in uh, Belmont. And then suddenly you're in the booking room with police dragging in people 
be arrested. I was filling out types. I could type. That was one good thing. I could type pretty fast. That's how I got the job. But I typed up arrest reports for police officers who would bring people in and, and then uh, do fingerprint, uh, fingerprinting and uh, taking the mug shot. So I did that for about nine months. That was real experience. One thing I remember was that bring in uh, people and they'd want to tell you their side of it. Uh, uh, it well, we would issue warrants too, Metro warrants. Um, so the, the night court was just on the side of that uh, across the hall and they'd go in and talk to the night court judge and get a, a permission for a warrant. They'd come over and I'd write up the warrant and they'd be telling me all about it and how this person had mistreated them and all of that. It's, uh, and then the, the police would bring in the person that had been arrested and he'd have a whole different side of the story. So they'd want to tell you that story for what good it was. So anyway, I learned that it's a valuable lesson. There's two sides to every story. So I did that and the police would bring in drunks. And sometimes we'd have a, a tap outs, that's regular drunks that were uh, regular ones there. And uh, they would uh, bring them in. And sometimes they would be too drunk to give us the information. And, they would, uh, and we just had to go, we'd have a card on them, we knew them, just, and some we didn't know, just had to get their description of them, and then one Sunday morning, I got selected to go up and try to find him in the drunk tank and <laughs> get his uh, information for the arrest report, <clears throat> and uh, the jailer had to go up the elevator to the jail at the time, which was over the fire department, uh, there on 2nd Avenue North, and to go up there in the, in the drug tank and jailer let me in and they closed and locked the door behind me and about 20 drunks in there and it stuck. Uh, but it, they were harmless, but that was the only time I've been in jail and had the, <laughs> had the <laughs> jail door closed behind me. Thank goodness, hopefully it, it never will be. But, uh, and then uh, I got the information, got out of there as quick as I had to call the jailer a few times to get him to come let me out. Uh, but then the, uh, the people brought in from all walks of life there for everything. And one time I had to go to court, took the fingerprints of somebody and that were part of a record in federal court in Lexington, Kentucky. And I got, I had taken the fingerprints. So I had to go up and testify in federal court in Lexington, Kentucky. I remember Price Nemo was the defense attorney and I talked to the DA beforehand and he asked, he knew I was from Nashville and Price was too, and uh, wanted to know if I what I knew about Price Nemo, and I didn't know much about him, of course. But then I got on the stand. I, I just tried to think beforehand of what questions he may ask me, and then he stood up and then he said, "No questions." So I, <laughs> I didn't get cross examined. I just had to identify the in the chain of evidence that that was the fingerprints. So that was that was interesting. That's the only time I had to go to court from then there. So. Now, I think I'm correct from when we went through this some months back that you had got a job at one point in time then as the clerk who sat yeah. it alongside the judge in the courtroom. And Yeah, the, uh, I was fortunate. One of the, the state clerk, we called him, was down there that would issue state warrants. So I got to know them, and they worked out of the criminal court clerk's office here. And Earl Hawkins was the criminal court clerk. Uh, which is, and so I went up and interviewed for that job and got accepted as a clerk there, which was interesting. I did mention that uh, back in college when uh, I was at Mississippi State, that uh, summer of uh, six, 1968, I was to go work for my uncle Alf Rutherford that was a circuit court clerk here uh, in the courthouse as a summer job. Well, he died in May, mid-May of 1968, right before I uh, ended uh, college there at Mississippi State uh, at the end of May. So I didn't have a job that summer. But interestingly, I was supposed to go to work in the circuit court clerk's office. And I, I didn't get a job in for George Rooker. Uh, he had enough people he was hire, hire, hiring for those summer jobs. So he didn't hire me. But interestingly, uh, uh, three years later, I ended up going to work or four years later, I guess it was, for Earl Hawkins in the criminal court clerk's office there. And they had me calling the docket in General Sessions Court uh, originally for 
A.A. A. Birch Jr., Gail Robinson, and John T. Boone. I'd call, they'd rotate the criminal docket there in General Sessions Court, which was in the public safety building, now the Ben West building there. So I did that and got a good court experience. That started in, I believe, eight, um, summer of 1972. And I worked there for three years, calling the docket. Eventually, the judges rotated. Uh, Judge Murphy uh, was on, Judge Bondelli senior and uh, 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 Randall White was, was uh, judge there. And I remember, interestingly, uh, Judge White had just been elected. He'd been a police officer and then an attorney and I think district attorney. And he was a judge. First day court was convened and um, he, uh, he uh, came in and sat down and leaned over to me and said, now, this is my first day of the bench on the bench. If you think I'm doing anything wrong, let me know. <laughs> I thought we're in trouble now. <laughs> and of course, he was a great judge, great guy, and uh, I enjoyed that. He he did did fine, so that was that was good. But got to see a lot of interesting cases. There's a lot of difference between the judges on how they handled things. Uh, judge Birch was real strict and demanded. Uh, um, pretty well perfection. Gail Robinson would go through uh, faster than anything. You had to keep up with him. Uh, and he had a lot of a lot of humorous stories on the bench. I remember one guy getting up one time and uh, before him, and very country fellow. And Gail handled it well, and he was very belligerent toward Gail. And for Casey heard, he said, "If you if if you don't rule in my favor, I'm going to repeal." Your case across the street to the big courthouse, <laughs> rebuild and so uphill, <clears throat> and uh, just different things would come about. It, it was very fun. And then the third week of John T. Boone, it was real relaxed, slow. Uh, he was a, a good, good guy and good old fella, and, and uh, everything was loose. So it's big difference between the. And then I'd go to law school at night, of course. So times were. Uh, Days were pretty full then. I, yeah. I couldn't do that now. I wouldn't want to try. Okay. And I've got a note here that in law school, um, you had mentioned previously domestic relations and wills and chancery. And is that pretty much the areas of law that you focused in once you became a lawyer? Yeah, those those pretty much. I remember uh, Tyree Harris and Wills was a great lawyer. Uh, Harris Gilbert was was a great lawyer, a great professor, and Harris Gilbert was great too. I remember those two as just being outstanding, um, and some of the others uh, uh, as well were very very good. I think they've got a good good bunch of professors now uh, teaching out there, but probably improved over even when I was there. So, And I think the Rutherford firm historically throughout most of its existence has been fairly prominent in handling domestic relations cases right. in Davidson County. So you're sort of following along in the footsteps of your ancestors and there. That's right. Jimmy Rutherford did a lot of divorces. And then I, um, a few years ago, about five years ago, I was up at the uh, Nashville library here on church street doing just killing some time my wife was auditioning for the uh, to be a contestant on wheel of fortunes down at uh fourth and church so i went up there and thought i'd kill some time and i knew ken fee the uh archives director there so i just went through uh and i was looking at some, they had some old chancery records uh books those old big books i used to use from Far back, I remember in 1921, looking, well, I just picked it up and going through there, the minute book. And the uh, my grandfather was in there, all, Charles Henry Rutherford Sr. was in there all the time. He was, they had the, 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 the divorce book, I guess. And he had, uh, he was, he was representing about one out of three or four divorces he handled, that many back then. So I'd see it, saw where Jimmy Rutherford got into that. So, I went all through that book and he was all over there on divorces. I didn't realize that. I know later practice was more in wills and, and chancery and that type of thing. But 
I think that was in Chancery Court back then, the divorces, but uh, he did more in wills and states later on, but back in the 20s and probably before, he was doing a lot of a lot of divorce work, more than I realized until I went through that. Going through those old books and seeing your family so prominent in those records, how what was your reaction to that? I guess on two levels, maybe, as a genealogist and historian would be one, and then the other would be as a lawyer. But how did you react to that? Oh, it was very interesting, very uh, to see it, uh, see that. And some of the last names he represented, I remembered. Uh, I, they were still clients when I was practicing, but I remember those. Uh, uh, those. It, it's interesting. In, in, in the um, uh, courthouse on the fifth floor, I don't know if it's still there or not, there's a glass case of some of the um, historical records, and one of them is, is my grandfather's income tax return from 1920 on there, and had his income, and that's the year my mother was born, had his income in there, and uh, the deductions, and all of that, uh, and then some other rather for, from the uh, his brother and uh, uh, son, Alf Rutherford, both named Alf Rutherford, and they, both of those were uh, records of that were in that case. Um, so I assume they're still there. I hadn't checked recently. And then uh, you mentioned earlier, um, and, and I know for a fact you were, you came late in life to getting married. Oh gosh, I was an old bachelor until I was 66. Um, uh, too busy partly to uh, get married, and then I uh, met my wife at church. We were both Andrew ministers in the Methodist Church. She got put on my team, uh, went to Brentwood Methodist and Methodist all my life until a few years ago. And um, we started dating, and she knew my uncle and some of my first cousins had run around together, they'd gone to church together back in. And she was uh, elementary school. In fact, uh, Frank Rutherford, my mother's brother, was her elementary school principal. <laughs> and uh, at Ross, I believe, was school. Uh, so he and she was, uh, he was her favorite uh, principal and one of her favorite, uh, he didn't teach her, but one of her favorite uh, people. And, and, and uh, so she knew that part of the family and ran around with her first cousin. They bought horses together and uh, taught uh, at the Y and all together. And uh, my uh, mother uh, grew up living in the house where her grandmother lived. And her grandmother lived downstairs and her mother and father lived upstairs over on Eastland. It was just around the corner from where my mother I grew up, and uh, my mother was a fourth grade teacher, and my wife eventually became, a, or was a fourth grade teacher from East Nashville as well. But anyway, uh, they, they lived uh, with her uh, grandmother in that big old house on Eastland Avenue. And uh, one morning, my uh, grandmother, her grandmother rather, had passed away. They found her died in her sleep. So uh, her mother, uh, packed her off to school there at Ross. She was in about the fourth, fifth grade. And um, she taught, saw my uncle, uh, who was principal, and, and it told him right away that her, her grandmother had died. And he, Frank Rutherford said, well, what are you doing here then? So he packed her up in his car and <laughs> took her home. <laughs> her mother was probably needing some peace and quiet and all of that and time to mourn, and there she was <laughs> back again. <laughs> he took her home. So uh had that connection. So that was that was interesting. But anyway, we've been happily married for nine years now. Um, and uh I had a nice house in Cree Hall and we sold that and it's about three thousand Four bedroom, three thousand square foot house. We sold that and um, renovated hers. Went through eighteen months of renovation. She lives out on Hope Road. And we live out on Hope Road. So that's been an interesting thing to, uh, that renovation and, and living there. But I've settled pretty well in the married life. I think I, she tells people she made me go through husband training one hundred and one <laughs> uh, beforehand. And, 
Occasionally, if she'll tell me, you're going to have to repeat that, <laughs> of course. Well, you all have a beautiful home, and I was um, around for some of that renovation. And yeah, You and were at our wedding, too. You yeah, know, yeah. You were at I was Christmas. just thinking that that was one of the highlights of my life, was being invited to be a participant in your wedding. And there was a funny incident about that when they sent the tuxedo and mine was the only one that didn't have a vest. So yeah. I had to get behind everybody <laughs> for the photographs because I wasn't properly <laughs> tired. <laughs> yeah, you drove us uh, doing from the re reception there afterwards. And in Roslyn, your, your role, that was very nice of you. Yeah, I remember you had your little uh, chauffeur cap and only they were the chauffeur then. I remember being told that you were trying to figure out what to do about transportation or or Virginia was. And you said, well, I happen to have a friend who has a Rolls Royce. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, was, that was a good experience. Um, well, we've talked about some of the issues with your career as a lawyer. Um I've got a note here about you being night court commissioner for eight or nine months at one point in time. Yeah, after I uh, graduated from law school, and I guess it was June of 1974, I studied for the bar that summer. I was still worked in the criminal court clerk's office. I passed the bar in October of 1974, and it'll be 50 years this October. Right. I've been, been practicing. Uh, and... Um, they were had two night court commissioners. The General Sessions Court judges at that time were trying to get away from alternating down in night court, uh, handling the duties down there. So they were appointing commissioners, Art Pulliam, and there's one other uh, commissioner, and they were looking for a third, and I was filling in down there. And at the time, and uh, uh, as a night court commissioner do, doing that, which is right beside the booking room. So I kind of graduated up to that. And that was uh, a real experience. I actually performed a couple of marriages at the time. People would come in on the spot. And they were pretty sorry marriages, but uh, marriage ceremonies anyway. Uh, but anyway, uh, did that and uh, performed the duties of a night court judge essentially essentially but the call of night court commissioners and so i did that at night uh, either five to about midnight or midnight to seven and we'd rotate doing that and now i think we've got five or six night court commissioners down there and a lot of that has really changed since uh since i was there I had some real interesting experiences down there the police would bring the great uh Houses of ill repute, and they bring in the girls in the sheets and all of that. And, uh, and then one time they brought in all this marijuana, just bricks of it, might have been 10 huge bricks, and they'd set them up on my uh, desk there and then leave, take them, and they'd all spilled out. I had a, I had a desk covered in marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I thought somebody could come in and arrest me, so I just shoveled it into the uh, trash can, and I assume people that come in could smell that marijuana the whole time. So there were, there were a lot of interesting experiences there. Well, take a minute and tell us about the movement of your office and the different places where you've been uh, physically as far as practicing law. Well, when I started out, I was with... Um, Charles Rutherford had just retired. Jimmy uh, uh, Rutherford and Dave Rutherford were still practicing. Jim Gunther and Ty Bottdorf. Uh, Rutherford Crockett Gunther, uh, Boss Crockett, who, married, who was also an uncle, married my, my mother's sister. He was practicing there. So I had uh, uh, three uncles, I guess it was, and I practiced with and Ty Bottdorf. So that was nice having mentors there. I don't know how someone starting out without having mentors there to practice with could, could do it. I wouldn't want to do that. So I was real fortunate in that regard, practicing with them, going to court, learning the ropes. Uh, Jimmy Rutherford primarily was who I worked uh, with. Battle Claiborne had been the attorney there and was wanting to uh, 
get out of private practice. And so I took over his cases and, and uh, mainly handling divorces, general sessions criminal, because I was familiar with that. And we'd go before the judges I had clerked for, which was nice, and knowing them and they knew me. Um, I, but we did a lot of divorces back then. I remember twice I handled five uncontested divorces in one day. <laughs> um, and that was uh, something I wouldn't want to do again. But now, uh, anyway, we'll get into the changes there. But anyway, I, we practiced, it was the National City Bank Building where my grandfather had um, been, uh, of course, he'd been all over uh, different places, uh, uh, seen where he, his office had been moved from uh, either the Stallman Building, the Chamber of Commerce Building uh, there, and uh, he moved into the National Trust Building in 1924. He was one of the original tenants at 315 Union Street, now the Indigo Hotel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, when I started in, in 1975, summer of 75, um, they were practicing there, and we practiced there. It became an association in 1980, individual attorneys, but we practiced there until, uh, I guess, Thanksgiving or so of 1988. We moved when they were throwing everybody out, still be there probably, but had, we had to renovate the building, and so we had to move, and we went to Washington Square, 2nd Avenue, no, 2nd Avenue North. And... Um, practice there until um i guess it was 20 for 20 years practice there uh, until 2008 mm -hmm. and then moves to um germantown practice then was uh paul and wendy rutherford paul my first cousin and wendy his wife we practiced there until um for 10 years 2018 and afterwards uh, moved to um our office out at uh, near Opryland, Opry Mills area, or still have an office there, and I have a satellite office in Brentwood. And you work most of the time out of your home. Yeah, I, in, beginning in 2008, I, I started operating more out of my home and going in to see clients and doing depositions and then, of course, going to court. But it was easier with computers now, with phones. I could have phones were set up at, at I'd ring through the office uh, home and clients wouldn't know I wasn't at the office. Um, so that was a real handy thing to have. And I had a secretary that at the time was uh, working from her home and could uh, I could dictate into a machine, put it into the computer and transfer it to her. She'd type the work, put it back in the computer, shoot it to email it to me to print out. It was you know, the technology was amazing what we could, could do. Um, it's one of the things. Otherwise, I couldn't, I had to go in every day. And especially now with traffic the way it is in, in Davidson County, you're 11, we're essentially in Brentwood. So it's a hard drive to, to get into, uh, get into the courthouse. It's nice and not having to go down all the time, but I'm doing that in mediation and Zoom. It's, uh, the epidemic doing Zoom court hearings now it's, it's right. really great. And when I started, they were doing typewriters, at least the IBM Selectric typewriters, carbon paper. I remember when uh, fax machines came in in the early 80s. David Rutherford said, "Well, I don't know if this is going to go over. We better better um, rent one rather than buy." I think we paid about fourteen hundred dollars for that renting it, but. Eventually, now fax machines have about got out, but yeah. uh, fax machines and computers now and uh, all the telephone technology and, and all of that has been incredible that I've, I've seen. What, what have been some of the changes with respect to your practice specialty uh, during the almost 50 years that you've been practicing? Did a, a lot of divorce work, of course, in criminal general sessions, civil general sessions. I still do a little bit of civil, but the divorce work is primarily what I do in probate. It's gradually 
gotten over to probate, kind of like what my grandfather did, I think. Maybe that's the natural, natural progression as you get older and you know more folks that are passing away and uh, your clients pass away too. Um, and so you, you graduate, gravitate more toward uh, probate work than, than before. Uh, wills and states, I do a little, that's about half my practice at family law issues now, I guess, and a little bit of chance for any partition suits and a few cases there, but not many. So, and mainly practice in Davidson and surrounding counties. I have uh, stick primarily to that, Robertson, uh, uh, Sumner, on in Williamson, Wilson County a good bit, and uh, Rutherford County. So, my general areas of practice. I've actually got one in Macon County now that I don't I got involved in, <laughs> but um, anyway, the uh, but otherwise, pretty much right around here. Well, I have a note here about Nick Fielder, and I'm not remembering the connection on that. But one of the other things I know you've gotten interested in lately that's um, uh, an interesting area is dousing. Yeah, well, uh, and, and is Nick connected with your interest in that, or is that something else? That's, um, yeah, that's connected. Uh, I'm in the General Sessions Committee of the Bar Association, of the Historical Committee, and the Memorial Resolution Committee, where we memorialize attorneys that have passed away. Well, the Historical Committee has a subcommittee looking into trying to find the grave of John Haywood uh, out at um, uh, Nolan's, uh, Nolan's Road there here in Nashville. So he was a um, jurist in North Carolina before coming to Tennessee. He did some works here, uh, wrote some books, and was a pretty famed jurist, a uh, friend of Andrew Jackson. He's buried out there uh, behind his old house. Now it's a, it's a Baptist church. I can't think of the name of it. Tuscombe. Tuscombe Hills Baptist Church. And so there's a little bit of land out there, and he's 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 buried somewhere out there. At some point in time, it was farmland. The farmer moved the headstones, put them up against a tree. So we don't know the exact site. And so they'd gone out. Uh, Nick Fielder's working on it. He's a retired state archaeologist. And he and some others, uh, George Payne, uh, heading up the committee and were trying to locate the grave. They got some pretty... Uh, sophisticated uh, uh, ground penetrating radar from MTSU. They thought where they uh, were going to his grave, and they went dug up a whole huge area and couldn't find it. And so I got into. I remember from Natchez, the uh, 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 cemetery, the guy down there had told me we were trying to locate some graves of my grandfather's sister and her husband, and. And he had mentioned dousing, where it's kind of like dividing rods. You go find water. You can also find graves. And so I got interested in that. So I've gotten dividing rods, dousing rods. Member of the uh, American Society of Dousers now <laughs> joined that. And I've gone around cemeteries finding, practicing finding graves. It's interesting. You come up on a grave with a you have two rods and they cross when you get to the grave and then they uncross when you get off the grave. And some dousers can even tell whether it's a male or female buried there, interestingly. But anyway, I've gotten into that. I've been out there trying to find it. So we're trying to get some more sophisticated equipment. We're waiting on that to try and find it. He's probably buried under the parking lot there, is what Nick Fielder thinks. And I've been out there. I haven't had any good hits on that. Uh, and, temporary hits and then they kind of fade out. So I don't know, uh, that's an ongoing project and we've raised about $20,000 to find his grave of him and his sister, his wife and a child we think are buried there. And so we're uh, trying to find his graves and relocate those to the Nashville City Cemetery. We've got funds for that. So uh, that's been a project being held up by the MTSU right now, but hopefully in the next few months we'll be able to do that. And I want to go out again and try to try to find it and and see um, see if we can can find those find those graves. Hopefully we can. Who were some strong influences on your early career? 
Well, of course, my uncles, David Rutherford, uh, Jimmy Rutherford, uh, to an extent, Miles Crockett, Jim Gunther, John Bottorf that I practiced with would be uh, ones that I think were very strong influences, especially Jimmy Rutherford and David Rutherford. Particularly, they gave me a lot of uh, good advice, a lot of uh, good old sayings and things like that. And the old uh, stories they tell me about Nashville uh, lawyers. And, and one thing we talked about beforehand, you and I did, we think the bar has gotten more professional than than uh, when we started. There were a lot of characters, which I miss, uh, but a lot of things went on in courtrooms that you know wouldn't go along, along now. And then with the rules of civil procedure, which when I started, they were still calling the new rules. <laughs> the new rules. <laughs> now they're the old rules. Uh, promulgated in 1970, so they are yeah. the old rules. Yeah. Um. Let's talk a little bit about some of the professional, economic, and maybe even social atmosphere uh, changes in the legal community over the last 50 years. Well, the, the way the courts have changed with, uh, you know, the computers in the courtrooms, and uh, I think the judges have gotten uh, a little bit nicer, easier to practice before uh, the judges have changed uh, there was there were no women judges and now there's a number of women judges judge birch who i worked with was the only black judge here the um uh, it, it's just gotten uh, with computers and like i said with zoom court hearings and uh, it, it's just gotten totally different from what it's still motion dockets and things like that i don't think other than maybe a few outlying counties they don't have docket calls where you go into court periodically and they just call your case and you'd have to report on the status of it and you're there half a day just to do that now you it's you don't go through all that it's the time wasted in court is a lot less than it, it used to be what about the the functioning of the office itself or the change in staffing in an office? Well, you don't need secretaries as much now. Um, uh, one secretary can handle several attorneys uh, with the computers. I remember Boss Crockett would be doing, he did a lot of brief work, briefs and uh, doing a lot of changes and secretary his secretary had to keep making changes with that carbon paper and all that, and that'd be a lot easier with computers and adjusting. Um, I don't remember what was the question. <laughs> well, what has changed with staffing? For oh, staffing, yeah. Office, and besides and just the, the receptionist, uh, a lot of times can can be uh, it, it can just be the. Uh, you don't need a, a, a telephone operator, particularly. You just hit a button and, and go to that. And you go to voicemail a lot of times. And you can, I didn't have voicemail back when I started. You had to have a, a receptionist to handle that. And now a lot of attorneys just have, um, goes to voicemail or, or whatever. And you have just someone to kind of check out the office when somebody comes in. So that's changed. Um, and I, I don't know about runners. People have runners taking things to around the different offices. Now you can email, email, and that's an acceptable, acceptable form of certificate of service. Now you just email the attorney, and um, and just the e-filing system that's come into place where you e-file. That's been a great benefit. We don't have to run to the courthouse all the time to, to file something. You just file it electronically. That's uh, a whole lot easier. You had mentioned 9-11 earlier <clears throat> in this interview, and, and uh, uh, that certainly was one item that impacted um, pretty much everything in society, security at the courthouse. And, oh, yeah. Um, but what are some other things that you have seen in 50 years that have impacted uh, the practice of law. Well, touching on that, the security, it used to be you, you just walk right in. You could just walk right in back and see the judge in chambers and, you know, see his staff and all that. Now you've got to 
bring in all that security, which was a good thing. You know, they remember David and Rutherford telling me about lawyers shooting each other at the courthouse or the chancery clerk shooting the judge one time back in the 20s and they played him out on the table there. Um, uh, so it's gotten, um, security's been a good thing. The courthouse, you don't, I miss interacting a lot with the staff, though, the court staff that you, uh, the secretaries back there and the, uh, all of that, the clerks you still uh, communicate with and you go, Random, rarely go to the clerk's office. I had to go today to file an original or something, but rarely uh, need to file anything. Uh, you can mail it in, uh, just e file most things now. Uh, those are some of the major changes, I think. What about in your divorce work? Um, how has mediation and child support and parenting plans? Uh, how has that evolved over the last 50 years? That's that's really changed. Uh, and of course, early on too, I, one thing I was thinking about the other day, DNA tests, I was doing paternity cases. Years ago, we just bring the ch little child in and judge would look at him and we'd try to figure out if, which, if he looked like the father or not. <laughs> <laughs> and now you got DNA, it clears it up pretty quickly. Uh, but you have, um, uh, uh, well, in the divorce case practice, you have uh, parenting plans now. You didn't, well, we had what we call property settlement agreements. Now we have marital dissolution agreements that incorporate everything. I don't even think we had property settlement agreements when, when I started. It was just, you just list what the, I know we didn't, you just list the, uh, terms of the uh, of the settlement or, or trial, the uh, judgment in the in the final decree. Then they came up property settlements and then marital dissolution agreements where everything was set out there by contract. And um, and and the reconcilable differences came back about 1977. Before that, when I started in 1975, you had to prove grounds get a divorce, and then they had irreconcilable differences and starting in 1977, where you didn't need any witnesses. It was like a divorce by contract. We just write it out in property settlement or marital dissolution agreement now. And uh, everything was agreed to. The child support was just kind of hit or miss, the um, um, amount of child support. Uh, then they came up sometime in the 90s, I think, late 90s, with the uh, child support worksheet where you kept, you threw in the uh, income figures of the parties uh, and, and what uh, visitation or parenting time, they call it now, was how much a days a year each side got and then the medical insurance, you put the, plug those figures in and whammo, the computer would come up with, after a few seconds, would come up with the figure of child support and that's pretty well what it is. It is what it is. It's hard to overcome that only under certain circumstances do you modify that but it's the same uh, amount and then you do parenting plans that spell out all the visitation of parenting times you get uh, weekends and holidays summer uh, winter uh, Christmas time and all of that spelled out in the parenting plan so you know what it is I used to get calls at home how many times on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day on some dispute the parties had as to who got Christmas that year. Uh, and you had to deal with it best you could or weekend time even. Now you don't get those calls anymore. Of course, I don't have a whole phone anymore. They can't call me. But um, uh, it's all set out, which is a good, good thing. Would you say that divorce and estate practice now is more or less structured than it was 50 years ago and in what ways well of course the divorce and what i was saying um, yeah. uh, marital dissolution agreement parenting plans um and mediation mediations come about around it's required it's been around for a long time and the divorces have been got required maybe in the early 2000s and that's been a good thing. That's settled most cases that hadn't settled before then will settle that mediation. You get a good mediator, Rule 31 mediator, 
he can twist some arms or she can twist some arms. And most cases um, are settled that way. It's rare you do a contested divorce. If it is one, it's one with a lot of property or you're dealing with um, child custody issues. But that's gotten a whole lot more structured than than before. The probate, I, I believe that they've gotten more probate rules as far as um, what to put in pleadings and that type of thing, the requirements. Um, it used to be fairly hit or miss, but now that's gotten pretty structured. And <clears throat> excuse me, the new probate judge, Hedrick, uh, has a lot of rules which are good that are structured, that are even more structured than than before. So I think that's been a good thing. So yeah, I've seen a whole lot more structure. I don't, so the things I started practicing with um, years ago and not practicing with but I, that I've seen uh, would, would have, would, would really be shocked at the changes that have come about. One of the things that we have discussed that uh, isn't specifically related to law, but it's an interesting thing that you got into, uh, involved the JCs and the Hugh O'Brien Youth Foundation. And I yeah. would like you to speak to the record on, first of all, who was Hugh O'Brien, and then what was your relationship with him? Well, the JCs, Junior Chamber of Commerce, uh, was an organization here of young men 35 and under, and I got into that probably late 70s and really enjoyed that, got active. We had different projects. Uh, we'd run the um, uh, Hill Bryan Committee. We started about 1980, 81, getting involved in that. And that's a group of Hill Bryan started after meeting Albert Schweitzer. Uh, and it's a program for high school sophomores. And it involves um, uh getting uh, each state would have an individual state, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, may need a sip of water here to take that. Um, it was a project with outstanding high school sophomores, one from each, most schools from across each county or each um, high school in Tennessee would meet for a, uh, one weekend, long weekend, would hear business leaders speak professionally about the organization. Each of the 50 states had that. And Hugh O'Brien started it. He's an actor. He used to be wider back in the 50s and 60s. And uh, I got to meet him a number of times and work with him. For, uh, I got He came to our state seminar. Uh, and got to know him pretty well. Interesting, interesting fellow. And um, we'd have uh, state meets. Uh, he would come in, in Gatlinburg. I got met with him. I got selected to be a counselor and then a section leader at the national level in for week long seminars. And we're, you'd select a boy and a girl from each state, and they would meet, uh, get selected to go, all expenses paid to the, the national uh, uh, whole week of meeting business leaders. And we would, uh, uh, I think the first time was in Orlando, spent time down there for a week with Hill Bryan was leading it and met, met with other counselors from all over the country and, and uh, business and professional leaders from all over and astronauts. We went to NASA, got a private tour. You get private tours of things. It was really great. And then the one year it was in Boston and we had it at Harvard. Got to go to see some of the classrooms at Harvard and hear uh, professional people. Heard the head of GM speak. Uh, Smith was his last name at the time. Uh, several astronauts uh, I met of uh, the Carpenters. Uh, 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 Richard Carpenter got to meet him. I'm trying to think of some of the others we met. Um, just. Uh, people from uh, all walks of life that would come and talk at, at seminars there. And um, with Hill Bryan, we had to get the kids up in the mornings, uh, at least. Uh, I don't know where you were with talking about the Hugh O'Brien. Yeah, that was um, a real experience in, in meeting the other counselors. It was an honor to get selected to, to go to the national one if you were 
a state leader. I was in charge of the state here for a year or two, and we'd uh, get the kids and have to house them for a weekend at a hotel and then have the leaders come in and talk. And Hugh O'Brien came down, like I said, for that one. And uh, But I also met with him at the off his office in L.A., uh, but the, I uh, got to know him fairly well. He, uh, was an actor and I didn't realize he was still acting. So I saw him, uh, recently in a, uh, old Perry Mason where he was the, actually the attorney filling in for Perry Mason and trying to case him there. And, uh, he, he was interesting. He was from Chicago originally. His, his name that wasn't his real name, O'Brien. It was his stage name. He had a brother that was an interesting character that we met. But anyway, he uh, he, he talked about his acting career a good bit, and that he said he was uh, uh, the last man that was shot by John Wayne in the movie uh, The Shootist. And you can watch that movie toward the end. Bill Bryan plays a bad guy, it's a Western, and gets. Uh, uh, John Wayne shoots him in the head. <laughs> mm. Very graphic there. But anyway, he did that and uh, was in several others and uh, was, a, was a pretty nice guy. He'd have a, uh, he'd take us afterwards to, a, uh, after the national seminar was over that week, he'd take the group out, the counselors and sexual leaders out somewhere in Orlando. It was to a Western theme park and, uh, he was. He did a shootout with somebody, stage shootout, and um, I didn't learn later until I, I read this. In, in real life, he was actually the quickest draw in Hollywood. He could draw faster uh, than anybody, and I mean, it was lightning. He would have been a great Western uh, uh, gunslinger in real life, but he did that, and uh, somebody took a. I was on a Ferris wheel and. Uh, so he hopped, saw me on there and he hopped on just the two of us riding around and one of the counselors took a picture of us. I still have it of uh, us riding that Ferris wheel around at that theme park. And, uh, I, could, I told somebody that I, uh, back in the day, uh, uh, little known fact is I rode with Rod Earp in the Wild West. <laughs> <laughs> I agree it was a theme park and we were riding on a, riding horses on a Ferris wheel. But anyway, that was that. And then in Boston, he uh, afterwards, he took us up to on a bus. You never know where you're going. You get surprised. He took us up on a bus to Salem, Massachusetts, to uh, the bay there. And we went out on a lobster boat. And it was a bar set up, all you could drink, and a big uh, barrel of lobsters. I think I had four lobsters. And just mm. throw them over. It was cold. August. It was in August. It was cold. But you just threw them over the side there when you were through. And I don't think anybody was feeling any pain. I don't remember the trip back to Boston on that bus, but it was a it was a good time. And then I, I got selected to do a third year. It was in LA and I decided not to do it. But I knew some of the counselors and one of the and he, I said, Where do you go afterwards? And he said, Well, pulled up to this big mansion and somebody said, That's the Playboy mansion. It was a Saturday, and, and sure enough, it was a Playboy Mansion, and they met um, uh, Hugh Hefner and his uh, girlfriend at the time, who was in, in the in the, in the spread there, Playboy, somebody said, and uh, met the staff, and they had hors d'oeuvres and drinks, and everybody, they said everybody was down to earth, very personable, very very friendly. So and, uh, that was uh, something I regret missing. <laughs> But uh, yeah, he uh, they did that then. But then uh, 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 it was part of the JC project. I don't think the JCs are handling that anymore. I think the Women's Club, and I think it's in Chattanooga rather than here in Nashville, from what I heard. What do you think have been um, some of the rewards that you've experienced and advantages of a legal career? Well, you meet a lot of folks in, in different walks of life. You see people's problems more, and you get to help people. I think that was that was one thing. Uh, try to help people if you can. Um, the um, I think folks look up to lawyers more. Uh, uh, 
than and, and I have folks come in and clients, potential clients, and I realize a lot of times they're really nervous. They have trouble talking and all that, and I try to put them at ease the best I can. I remember when I was um, working in, I was still in high school, uh, filling out a form for a loan for my college, and I had to get the form notarized and take it over. There was a law firm just across the street from the drugstore, uh, a lawyer down there we knew who was a customer and so I had to go over there and get it notarized in front of him and I was nervous and went home and took a shower and put on a, a coat and tie and went over there to get it notarized and I, and I sat down I was scared to death <laughs> and I, I thought of that and I, I, I can try to put people at ease because it seems hard to believe they're nervous when they come in but I remember my one experience there on that what would you say are some of the hardships and pitfalls if you've experienced any in practicing law? Well, of course, dealing with clients uh, is a, is an issue sometimes of what they want and, and what I know that the court's going to do. Um, uh, as far as, and then, of course, being prepared, you need to be prepared. Uh, study the law as much as you can and get the facts, talk to witnesses. And bringing all your witnesses, uh, wit I've learned from my uncles, they told me witnesses win lawsuits, and that's that's true. And then uh, some of the judges could be fairly contrary, arbitrary early on, and I don't I haven't experienced that now as much as as before. They they're pretty um, uh, pr pretty reasonable. Uh, I think better educated. Than when I started, and um, more personable. They have the rules of judicial conduct now, and, and rules uh, of evidence, and it, it's gotten more structured that way. We didn't have rules of evidence back then. It was more case law, I think. But uh, the pitfalls of uh, getting surprised, and that's less likely now with discovery rules they've got and interrogatories and depositions you don't get surprised like it was kind of the, like the wild wild west sometimes when i started you'd go in there and uh you, trial by ambush trial by call it trial by ambush now you do responses to your motion so that you know what the other side's gonna defense is gonna be and the judge reads it beforehand they're prepared more know what they're gonna do a lot of times so it's it's gotten that way now i've heard um to the, some of the theatrics, uh, the, the older lawyers when, uh, or characters when I started and would be more theatrics. I think even my grandfather would heard would cite poetry and things like that and <laughs> arguments. You don't don't see that anymore. It's it's more in a way that's not as good and not as interesting. I remember uh, going at Enix one time uh, trying a case in general sessions and it was a real show I mean it was he was a good lawyer uh but really put on a, a show there and it was like an actor in in uh, a movie seeing him it was a real experience I was a clerk then I wasn't uh attorney then but I think Gail Robinson or A.A. A. Birch A.A. A. Birch I think was the judge and uh he'd, he'd have to I don't remember how that case came out but it was it was his his acting ability there. He, he missed his calling, I think. <laughs> he was you know? a great showman. Yeah. I remember watching a couple of cases that he did when I was a young lawyer. And uh, they were very entertaining. Yeah. And you're right. He was a great lawyer, but he was also a pretty good entertainer. Yeah. His son was different. He was a lawyer, too, and they practiced together. And so was just a great guy. I remember him. He died way too young. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a note here on hobbies, and we've covered most of those except your motorcycle. Do you still oh, have your motorcycle? I finally sold that a couple of years ago. Uh, I decided I was getting too old to do that. I was 73, and I felt like that was old enough to give it up. It was, it was getting more dangerous, too, with folks being distracted on cell phones and things. But I I had, a, had that Harley for probably, oh, 15, 16 years, I guess. Had two of them rode out west to 
Montana and Wyoming on it to, with Jim Curtis, a Nashville lawyer. And we rode up to uh, Milwaukee a few times and then I'd ride uh, around the Great Lakes, did a few trips there, went up to northern parts of Canada, Quebec City, and up north of there on it uh, from Nashville, just taking off for a couple of weeks, went to Key West and on it, excuse me, down to Natchez, a few, about four times went down to Natchez Trace on it. So, into Louisiana, southern Louisiana. I had some good long trips on that. I just enjoyed taking off. I was with my single days pretty much after I got married and had to take husband training 101. <laughs> <laughs> that was harder to do. My wife, interestingly, had her own Harley and rode and sold it just about two years before we met. She rode with a biker. She started actually a few, bought it for her 50th birthday and rode with a biker organization in Williamson County for a number of times and she gave it up. There were several people in, in her group that ride on Saturdays, two were killed. Um, one of them ran into the other one and the other, I think her car hit. She wasn't mm. participating those weeks, but she decided to, to give it up. Otherwise, uh, we would have ridden together probably on more trips. And she rode behind me a few times, but she wanted to be the driver. So <laughs> <laughs> that would have looked good on Harley having a Girl driving a boy that's behind her. Yeah. That would that was an unwritten no no, I think. Well, what have you got on your bucket list that you haven't done? Well, going to Hawaii, we're doing that in August. I hadn't been to Hawaii. And they're spending a couple of weeks there, going on a cruise there. Uh, maybe going on a three cruises on our honeymoon. We did a a Mediterranean cruise, and that was good to Greece and Turkey and Italy. And I've climbed up Mount Vesuvius three times, <laughs> done that. Um, don't know that I've cared, maybe going to uh, Japan or somewhere like that would be good. I've kind of wanted to do that and possibly China. Um, so, so a little bit more travel, uh, but I don't know that I've got any other other things to do. I've enjoyed traveling. My wife likes to travel. So we'll probably do that. Maybe uh, uh, Southern Asia, uh, or, uh, what is it? Uh, Southern Pacific is what I'm trying to say, not Southeast Asia. I don't care we go there. But uh, South Pacific, maybe some of those islands, Australia would be, be good to do. So those would be on my, my bucket list. Is retirement on your radar screen? Getting very close to that. Very close now. I thought about it a lot in the last few months and going to slow down a lot. I know uh, it's hard to do practicing law. Uh, I remember David Rutherford saying he was trying to retire, slow down a lot. And he said, say he's busier than ever. Yeah, he was on the glide path to retirement yeah. for a number of years. Yeah. <laughs> That's how he characterized it. Probably for 10 or 15 years, but. So he, he, he'd do that, but I, I plan on just really cutting down if I can on the, on the cases I take, maybe just uncontested divorces and uncontested probates and estates and that type of thing, try to do just that. So you really don't have a target date quite yet? Definitely not uh, past 80. I don't want to go past 80. That's four and a half more years from now. So I, I, I've kind of set that as the benchmark. Of course, it was 75 at one time, too, and I've already hit that. So I can remember, actually remember, when I couldn't envision working at my age now, and I'm sure yeah. you probably had that same experience. And of course, it seems to me, you may differ, that people don't age, for the most part, as radically as they did when we were young. Well, healthcare has gotten better, and you got, you know, I've had a knee replacement. You can replace about anything now in the body, <laughs> and um, uh, all kinds of heart surgery, and I ain't had that, but other things they can do now that they can, uh, that they didn't used to be able to. It used to be people hobbling around, now they replace hips and, and, I, and I can remember as a child, uh, the World War I veterans were the age that we are now, and they all seemed to me back then way more decrepit yeah. than I feel like most of us are at this age now. Yeah, and Dave wrote for practice to 83, 
he was 80 or 82, I guess, died at 83. And um, Jimmy Rutherford was 70, almost 76. And he died. My grandfather was early 80s when he died. And he uh, practiced up until a few years before that. So, well, I've come to the end of my notes, and I think that we've pretty much covered everything that we had on here. Is there anything else that you would like to make a part of the record of your life and your legal practice that we haven't covered? I can't think of anything else. I think we've covered it well. We did better in this time than the first time. When the first time we recorded it, we learned that several weeks later the recorder was not set up. It was not <laughs> on. <laughs> This is the second time. Well, and I, I think, you know, do-overs are sometimes better, but I feel that we've done a better job of it today than we did the first time, and I thought we did a good job well, the first time. I know. I, I think we have. We've covered a lot more this time, and it's gone a lot longer. Maybe we ought to do a third time. Well, and <laughs> we've managed to do it in about 15 minutes less time, so... Oh, we really? streamlined it a little bit. I was going to check the time. No, I think we did it in more time. Today? Yeah. Oh, well, I was thinking that we had exceeded two hours last No, time. no. Well. I guess that's it. The I end. That's it. The end. <laughs>